meaningful public discourse of outstanding issues, problematic topics, this discourse is being subverted by victimhood movements, woke movements, and exclusionary, vindictive identity politics. So, dialogue is dead. So censorship and political cor correctness have taken over. People are afraid to speak up. And they are afraid to speak up because self-identified victims, anything from empaths to Black Lives Matter to Me Too to the right-wing uh, victimhood movements, self-identified victims are punitive, they are vindictive, they are vicious, and above all, they don't hesitate to resort to immoral methods and actions and to make choices and decisions that easily victimize others. Why is that? Here is the dirty secret that no one is going to tell you, <laughs> except the iconoclastic black professor of psychology, or former visiting professor to be precise, Sam Vaknin, author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. And the dirty secret is this, the majority of social activists and political activists are mentally ill. Many of them, if not the bulk of them, are dark triad personalities, subclinical narcissists, subclinical psychopaths, Machiavellian. Quite a few of them are sadists as well and qualify for the dark tetrad. Social activism movements, social justice movements, political movements have always been hijacked by narcissists and psychopaths throughout human history. Nazism is a prime example of a victimhood movement hijacked by a psychopath, a narcissistic psychopath. So is communism, and so to a large extent is capitalism. When we are faced with issues of asymmetry of power, the misuse of potency, discrimination, and hurt and pain, when we are faced with these issues, there is a vulnerability, there's a chink in the armor, there's an opening, and through that gap, through that gap, armies, hordes of narcissists and psychopaths rush to take advantage, to leverage, to abuse the situation and the people involved. Victimhood is real. People have been victimized throughout history. I'm a Jew, I should know. Slaves. People have always been victimized. However, victimhood as an identity is a relatively new phenomenon, about 150 to 200 years old. Nationalism, in all its forms in the 19th century, was founded on victimhood. This is especially true where I am, in the Balkans, and to some extent in the Middle East. And so victimhood as an identity is a new thing. And now we have a malignant development of this, competitive victimhood. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the topic of today's video. Today's video deals with how victims compete with each other for the title of I am the greatest victim ever, and my abuser is the most demonic, devil diabolical, vicious abuser to have ever roamed the earth. Anyone who has visited empath communities know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm going to review three studies. Um, I have reviewed one of these studies on, in two videos. And so if you go to the description, which is under the video, if you go to the description, I advise you to watch the videos titled Narcissists, Eternal Victims, Trauma Psychosis, Splitting the Inner Dialogue. 
And the other video is Victimhood Movements Hijacked by Narcissists and Psychopaths. In these two videos, I deal with a study, a 2020 study, a study published three years ago by a group of Israeli scholars and researchers. I'm going to deal with this study in this video as well, in the third half, in the third part of this video. Uh, but first, I'm going to describe and analyze two other studies, um, and then we will gravitate naturally to the third one. Let's start by with a study by E.O.K. Yes, I'm kidding you not. Wai Qian, um, Aquino and others. This was a study published in July 2020. It is titled Signaling Virtuous Victimhood as Indicators of Dark Triad Personalities. It was published in Journal of Personality and Social Psychology and you can find um, reference, a citation to the literature in the description. It's an amazing and much neglected study, and it's much neglected for good reason. It flies in the face of many claims of victimhood movements and woke movements, and it casts these movements in a very evil and dark light, and they don't like it. These movements are now in control of all the media both online and offline, well, all the mainstream media, all the streaming platforms, platforms such as YouTube, LinkedIn, social media, victimhood movements are in control of all these platforms. If you dare to criticize victimhood movements, confront them with facts and studies, disagree with them, they punish you. They punish you viciously severely, vindictively, they cancel you, they ostracize you, they make other people shun you, they go on smear campaigns. I am now a subject of one such vicious smear campaign. So victimhood movements, small and big, a victimhood movement can be comprised of 10 people, can be comprised of 10 million people, but all of them have one thing in common, they use narcissistic and psychopathic techniques and methods, and they are sadistically punitive, unforgiving, and vindictive. Let's go to the study. The study links virtue signaling to dark triad traits. Virtue signaling simply means um, an insincere fake, feigned signaling of an underlying virtue, virtuous behavior, or a virtuous belief system or value system. Virtue signalers are phonies. They are show-offs. They adopt opinions and postures in order to garner praise and sympathy to extract narcissistic supply. In short, they are either narcissistic in the best case or outright narcissists in the worst. They need, they need everyone to see just how good they are, how virtuous they are, how amazingly morally upright they are, how heroic they are, and how they fight evil, being, of course, all good. It's a morality play coupled with a splitting defense. I'm all good. You're all bad. I'm protecting the helpless and the weak, and I'm going to punish you for your misdeeds. They are self-appointed. No one has elected them to office. No one has told them to take on the assignment of the administration of justice, but they are the equivalent of vigilantes. And they operate within a culture that says that victimhood confers a right. To be a victim is to have a right. And so rights confer obligations and duties on other people. If I have a right, you have a duty towards me. If I possess some kind of right, you have an obligation towards me. Rights and obligations are two sides of the same coin. So victimhood movements are entitled. They are demanding. Victims have discovered 
that victimhood empowers. Many of them have also discovered the financial benefits of victimhood. Um, look recently at the reparations for slavery movement or at the Jews taking billions of dollars from Germany only six years after the end of the Holocaust. Victimhood pays exactly like crime and very often victimhood is indistinguishable from crime. And so victims have monopolized the public discourse and the global dialogue because they have a right to speak up and you don't have a right to respond. You don't have a right to respond because you are all bad. You are evil. You are the abuser or the descendant of the abuser or somehow connected to the abuser. Or you could have been the abuser by virtue of your skin color or your education or the place you were born in. You are tarred with a wide brush as an abuser, as a perpetrator. And from that moment on, you should keep silent. And if you dare to speak up, you are continuing to perpetuate and perpetrate the abuse. And you should be punished for that, either in the public sphere, in the public arena, or even criminally and legally. So victimhood movements have co-opted the lev levers of power. Victimhood movements have now merged and fused with power structures. They have become the system. It's a system of victimhood. And having thus been empowered, victims are abusing their power rampantly. Look at the Me Too movement, for example. And so it's a very sick world we live in because victims, social activists, not victims, social activists and political activists are mostly mentally ill. Many of them are narcissists and psychopaths. The insane took over the asylum. Narcissists and psychopaths pretend to be moral, ethical, upright, honest, benevolent, but deep inside, they're just narcissists and psychopaths. And now they're using the levers of power to subjugate and penalize everyone who dares to confront them, to challenge them, to undermine them, or to suggest an alternative. Online pile-ons are an example of this. Social media platforms have been compromised by these victimhood movements, gun narcissistic victimhood movements and identity politics, gun psychopathic. They took over social media on the left. On the right, they took over talk radio. The media now is at the disposal and the mercy of these people. And these are seriously Machiavellian, one could even say evil people. This new research that I've just referred to is, I'm going to, I'm going to quote, looks at the consequences and predictors of emitting signals of victimhood and virtue. And so it's a very interesting study um, because it's not a single study. It's a series of studies, it's multiple studies that the authors conducted on exactly this subject. And what is the conclusion? Psychopathic, manipulative and narcissistic people are more frequent signalers of virtuous victimhood. They are competitive victims. Dark triad personality traits lead to characteristics like self-promotion, emotional callousness, duplicity, tendency to take advantage of others, explain the authors. And treated as a composite, as a composite, the dark triad traits were significant predictors of virtuous victim signaling. I can't tell you how terrifying these few words are. What it means is 
that as we have been transitioning from the age of digni dignity to the age of victimhood, and I'm now quoting the famous sociologist Campbell, as we have transitioned into the age of victimhood, narcissists and psychopaths took advantage of this transition, compromised the new power structures, pretended to be victims, and many of them do believe that they are victims because narcissists have alloplastic defenses and an external locus of control. In other words, they blame other people for their defeats and failures and misfortune and mishaps. So it's easy for a narcissist to say, I'm a real victim. I'm really a victim. You're wrong about that. And yet these movements are now infested with narcissists and psychopaths. And this holds true, say the authors, even when controlling for factors that may make people vulnerable to being mistreated or disadvantaged in society. For example, demographic and socioeconomic characteristics, as well as the importance they place on being virtuous individuals as part of their self-concept. The authors point out that virtue signaling is defined as the conspicuous expression of moral values done primarily with the intent of enhancing one's standing within a social group. Victim signaling may be used as a social influence tactic that can motivate recipients of the signal to voluntarily transfer resources to the signaler. This is, this is absolutely shocking. Victimhood is the organizing principle of today's society. Victimhood is the explanatory principle of today's world. It imbues the world with meaning and makes sense of reality. Victimhood is the new religion, together with narcissism, and narcissists consider themselves as victims. Narcissism is a victimhood movement. <laughs> and so we are at the mercy of narcissists and psychopaths masquerading as moral, virtuous, Victims, codependents, people pleasers, healers, rescuers, saviors, many of them are online as coaches, self-styled experts, you name it. This is a dangerous situation and there's an emerging literature on what is called competitive victimhood and it deals with the prevalence of victim signaling by various social groups. There is evidence that victim signaling carries some benefits. It's a functionality. It's a resource extraction strategy. This is a war for money, for power, for fame and celebrity. Today, the more victimized you are, the more of a victim you are. The more your identity is that of a victim, the more public exposure you gain. The more, likely to you, the more likely are you to have access to the media and the more money you're likely to make. And that is why on YouTube, there is a group of unscrupulous, immoral individuals with and without academic degrees who make a, who make a living out of perpetuating victimhood. Because there's a lot of money in it. Victimhood had become a cottage industry. Victim, victim signaling justifies victim groups seeking retribution against alleged abusers and oppressors. This is true on the collective level and it's, it's, it's true on the individual level. Victims feel totally entitled to behave immorally and even criminally in the pursuit of what they call justice. What kind of justice? the justice they decide on. They are the law. Retrib retribution takes the form of demanding compensation through some kind of resource transfer from non-victims to alleged victims. So claiming victim status can facilitate resource transfer by conferring moral immunity on the claimant and the complainant. It's an, it's an interesting kind of transactional landscape. All you have to do is claim victimhood of some kind. Ageism, 
ableism, sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, any ism goes. You just identify your slot and claim your prize. Moral immunity shields the alleged, vic alleged victim from criticism about the means they might choose to satisfy their demands. The minute you identify as a victim, you are beyond reproach. Anything you do is morally justified in the pursuit of restoring justice and balance. Your justice and your balance. You can act criminally. You can act immorally. You can act unethically. And it's all okay because you're doing these things as a victim. Victimhood identity, your ident victimhood stance is therefore a shield, a protection, a defense against the repercussions and consequences of your own actions. No wonder narcissists and psychopaths find victimhood irresistible. Victim status can morally justify the use of deceit, intimidation, bullying, criminal conspiracies, violence, verbal and otherwise, against um, alleged abusers, perpetrators and oppressors. In the pursuit of accomplishing their goals, victims are entitled to behave in any way they choose. They are above and beyond the law. They are the law. This is lynching. We're, we're in an era of all pervasive, massive lynching lynching of men by women in the wake of the Me Too movement, lynching of whites by colored people, lynching of uh, oppressors, alleged oppressors, <laughs> descendants of oppressors, could have been oppressors, by wannabe victims, fake victims, and above all, narcissists and psychopaths. Claiming a victim status can lead observers to hold the person less blameworthy, to excuse trans transgressions. Victims appropriate private property, inflict pain on other people. Normally, this would have been con condemned or rebuked, but not when you're a victim. When you're a victim, you're above reproach, above rebuke, above repudiation, and above condemnation. Claiming victim status elevates the claimant's psychological standing. There is a subjective sense of legitimacy, entitlement, and the right to speak up in the public arena and in the commons. The victim has a monopoly on the right kind of speech, and any other speech is castigated and chastised is evil and dark and backward and reactionary and wrong. It's a small step from this to criminalizing speech. And we are not far from that. A lot of speech is already being criminalized. There's self-censorship, there's political correctness. There is absolute fear to speak up. I can tell you that from personal experience. Absolute fear. A person who has the psychological standing can reject or ignore any objections by non-victims to the unreasonables of, of the demands of the victims. So if you're a victim, you don't have to listen to the other party, to the other side. You automatically have, you're automatically in the right. Your justice is on your side. God ist mit uns. God is with us. Do you know whose slogan this was? The SS. God is mit uns was carved on the knives of the SS. God is, God is with us. In contrast to victim signalers, people who do not publicly disclose their misfortune or disadvantage are less likely to benefit or to reap rewards. Retributive com compensation has become the only form of compensation. Moral, moral immunity and morality plays have become the only forms of morality. Deflection of blame has become the only way to blame. Guilt 
has been expunged. Victims never feel guilt. Whatever they may do, and many of them do horrible things, they never feel guilty. The effectiveness of victim signaling as a resource transfer strategy follows the basic principles of what, you, what, what we call signaling theory. <clears throat> Let me tell you a bit about signaling theory. Signaling theory says that the transmission of information from one individual, the sender, to, the other in, to another individual, the receiver, can influence the behavior of the receiver. Signals refer to any physical or behavioral trait of the sender. Signals are used by senders to alter the behaviors of receivers to their own advantage. I want to quote a few sentences from this amazing series of studies. A series of studies that has been suppressed actively, implicitly, passively, and explicitly because the discoveries of these studies are politically incorrect. And so this, these studies are censored and go to the description and make sure you read these studies. Show your support for truth. Here are a few sentences from these studies. A perceived victim signal can lead others to transfer resources to a victim, but that the motivation to do so is amplified when the victim signal is paired with a virtue signal. People high in the dark triad traits emit the dual signal more frequently. A positive correlation between the dark triad scores and the frequency of emitting the virtual, virtuous victim signal has been found. Evidence of how these signals can predict a person's willingness to engage in and endorse ethically questionable behavior, behaviors um, has been spotted. Frequent virtuous victim signalers are more willing to purchase counterfeit products and judge counterfeiters as less immoral compared with less frequent signalers, a pattern that was also observed when using participants' dark triad scores instead of the signaling score. Frequent virtuous victim signalers were more likely to cheat and to lie in order to earn, or earn an extra monetary reward in a coin flip game that a dimension referred to as amoral manipulation was the most reliable predictor of virtuous victim signaling. Frequent virtuous victim signalers were more likely to make inflated claims to justify receiving restitution for an alleged and ambiguous norm violation in an organizational context. The authors make clear we do not refute the claim that there are individuals who emit the virtuous victim signal because they experience legitimate harm and also conduct themselves in decent and laudable ways. But the infiltration of narcissists and psychopaths, that's, these are my words, the infiltration, the invasion of narcissists and psychopaths has contaminated the signal. The signal is now partly noise, narcissistic noise, psychopathic noise. Virtue signaling, morality plays. Casting yourself as a victim today is a suspect activity because narcissists and psychopaths are doing all these things in order to punish people, subjugate people, extract resources from people, manipulate people, cheat people and deceive people, and all this by claiming to be victims. I proceed to another study by Weissmel, Manor, Kaplan, Shenhav, Zlotnik, Dvir, and others. It is titled ADHD and Political Participation, an Observational Study. Again, you can find the link in the description. The conclusions of the study. Overall, say the authors, we find evidence that individuals with ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, individuals with ADHD display a unique pattern of political activity, including greater participation and less tolerance of others' views, but not necessarily showing greater active, active interest in politics. 
Our findings add to a growing body of literature that examines the impact of ADHD on different types of everyday behaviors. This is the anodyne camouflaging abstract. The study itself is nothing short of absolutely shocking. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a serious problem in childhood and recently we are discovering that it's a problem in adulthood as well. This study shows, demonstrates, that people with ADHD are more likely than the average individual to participate in politics, and even deeply so. They're very committed and invested in politics. And this is pretty, pretty counterintuitive and surprising because people with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder cannot pay attention to anything at length. They cannot focus on a task for any period of time. They are sometimes hyperactive to the point of mania. They act without prior contemplation of the consequences of their actions, so they have poor impulse control. And they are unable to analyze, synthesize, and go deep into any topic or issue. And yet these people, who can hardly put two and two together, they go into politics. They define politics. You will soon hear the numbers. A sizable minority of politicians, political activists, social activists, suffer from severe ADHD. So they're incapable of learning anything in depth, analyzing it rigorously, and reaching any decisions about the future that would make any sense. And yet these are the people who define the agenda and dictate the way you live. The condition is chronic, ADHD. It's debilitating. It leads to other issues that impact daily life individual relationships, interpersonal relationships, work life, they're all disrupted. And these are the people who engage in politics regardless of their age, sex, race, education, political orientation, and the levels of therapy that they're, re they're receiving, regardless of all this. So the authors, a group of Israeli scholars, I don't know why Israel is so concerned with victimhood, possibly because the Jews are have invented victimhood as identity politics. So the authors studied 1,369 participants, and that's a moderate size study, not small, not big, a moderate size study. About 15% of these people suffered from pronounced ADHD. And then they asked these people about their political participation and activism. They measured political participation in activism in a variety of ways over, over the course of a year. So this was a serious study, a longitudinal study. They measured activism online, offline, in via proxy, by proxy, directly, and so on and so forth. And then they compared the data with the level of news consumption of the participants and whether they were active in political parties, participated in politics, on social media, uh, had political opinions and shared them, and so on and so forth. And they discovered the following. Overall, say the authors, individuals who screen positive for ADHD reported higher levels of political participation than individuals who screen negative, both, both digitally and in traditional ways. That in itself is already, should already give you a pause. People with attention deficit disorder tended to express political opinion, opinion, opinions on social media, but did not consume news. These people were not exposed to the news, and yet they had very clear and rigorous and strong and irreversible political opinions and stands strikes you as narcissism? Right you are. This is grandiosity. 
these people were grandiose. The study noted that they didn't bother to read news, analysis, listen to news, watch news, compare with other people. They just made up their mind. So the famous saying, I've made up my mind, don't confuse me with the, don't, don't confuse me with the facts. Or if I want your opinion, I will give it to you. <laughs> These arrogant people, arrogant people with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder who are also grandiose and in all probability highly narcissistic, although this was not in the study. That is my interpretation. And so these people had zero or very close to zero input and yet felt that they are sufficiently authoritative and knowledgeable to dictate to other people how to behave politically and socially. In this sense, say the authors, our results align with previous work that finds that individuals who suffer from other health conditions in daily lives tend to participate more regularly in political activity, such as contacting a politician or signing a petition. Sick people, especially mentally ill people, are the ones who are active in politics. We're beginning to see the full picture. And among these sick people, grandiosity is rampant, psychopathy, narcissism, ignorance because you have attention deficit. These are the people who define your futures and control you via the levers of power, institutions, and mechanization. The study's authors noted that ADHD sufferers um, uh, expose themselves only to same-minded thinkers. So they get embedded in what we call echo chambers or silos, cognitive or thought silos. And so they go to social media, they find like-minded people, they team up with them, and then they don't bother to, they don't feel the need to read, to listen, to watch, to analyze, because everyone around them keeps telling them that they are right. They are less tolerant than other people. ADHD sufferers, according to the study, were less tolerant of other political views. This wasn't due to attempts uh, to fight democracy, but it had to do with their attentiveness issues. They couldn't, they didn't have the patience to listen to other people, and so they became very aggressive because they felt frustrated. Overall, say the authors, we find evidence that individuals with ADHD display a unique pattern of political activity, including greater participation and less tolerance of others' views, but not necessarily showing greater active interest in politics. And now we come to the seminal study, uh, a very, very important study, published three years ago. It was published in Personality and Individual Differences. I remind you, at the beginning of this video, I referred you to two other videos I've made in which I analyzed these studies, but I'm going to review them yet again. The studies are titled The Tendency for Interpersonal Victimhood, TIV, The Personality Construct and Its Consequences. It was authored by Rahav Gabay, Boaz Amiri, and others. The researchers coined the phrase Tendency for Interpersonal Victimhood. This is an ongoing, they describe it as an ongoing feeling that the self is a victim, which is generalized across many kinds of relationships. Here is the abstract of the study. The authors said, in the present studies, by the way, these were four studies, in the present research, we introduce a conceptualization of the tendency for personal, interpersonal victimhood which we define as an enduring feeling that the self is victim across different kinds of interpersonal relationships. Then, in a comprehensive set of eight studies, I'm sorry, not four, but eight, in a comprehensive set of eight studies, we develop a measure for this novel personality trait, TIV, and we examine its correlates as well as its, as its affective, cognitive, and behavioral consequences. 
In part one, two studies, we establish the construct of TIV with its four dimensions. Number one, need for recognition, narcissism, moral elitism, grandiosity, lack of empathy, again, narcissism and psychopathy, and rumination, obsession, compulsion, in a way. So these four traits, dimensions of personality are typical of professional lifelong victims, people who define themselves as victims, whose identity is an identity of victimhood. And then they assessed the internal consistency, 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 I'm sorry, stability, etc. etc. In part two, again two studies, we examine TIV's convergent and discriminant validities using several personality dimensions and the role of attachment styles as conceptual antecedents. They discovered that insecure attachment goes hand in hand with being a victim. In part three, again two studies, we explore the cognitive and behavioral consequences of TIV. Specifically, we examine the relationships between TIV, negative attribution, and recall biases, and the desire for revenge. Professional victims, empaths, are vindictive, they're vengeful because they consider themselves morally superior, because they lack empathy, because they're vicious, because they are psychopathic and narcissistic, they pursue the alleged abuser or perpetrator or oppressor to the end, viciously, maliciously, vindictively, and vengefully. This is not some Vakni. These are the studies. So, TIV, study number four, has shown that, demonstrated conclusively, that TIV, the tendency for interpersonal victimhood, is intimately linked with behavioral revenge. Participants high in TIV also reported experiencing more intense negative emotions and a higher entitlement to immoral criminal behavior. Mediation analysis offered insight. The revenge process in the mind of the perpetual professional victim, the vindictiveness of the I am a victim identity, is a process. It's, it's something that unfolds all the time. It's a background process. The authors say, the higher participants TIV, the more they experience negative emotions, felt entitled to behave immorally. However, only the experience of negative emotions predicted behavioral revenge. Gabay and her colleagues express a view. They say that their studies indicate that the tendency for interpersonal victimhood is a stable personality trait that is linked to particular behavioral cognitive and emotional characteristics. They say, and I'm quoting, it is deeply rooted in the relations with primary caregivers, these tend uh, parents. This tendency affects how individuals feel, think and behave in what they perceive as hurtful situation, situations throughout their lives. Now, there's an article by uh, um, there's an article uh, that later on analyzed the studies. It's titled Matters Arising from Gabai, etc., etc., the Tendency for Interpersonal Victim. And it reminds us that there is a precedent for tendency for interpersonal victimhood. 30 years prior, in the 1990s, there was something which was known as befallen injustice, sensitivity to befallen injustice, SBI. It was developed by Schmidt and, and others and his colleagues. It was later renamed justice sensitivity from a victim's perspective or JS victim. In 2005, Schmidt published an article about JS victim, justice sensitivity from a victim's perspective and nicknamed it 
victim sensitivity together with Goldwitzer, Goldwitzer in 2013. So it's not a new idea. The Israeli authors misrepresent tendency for interpersonal victimhood as a new concept or a new idea. It's not. It's absolutely not. TIV and victim sensitivity are one and the same. Gabay conceptualized TIV in a way with four indicators, the four indicators that also define justice sensitivity. Frequency of observed injustice, emotional intensity and mental intrusiveness of observed injustice, motivation to restore justice, etc., etc. There's a, a great analysis by Baumert and Schmidt in 2016. In a way, the Israeli authors hijacked, and I don't want to use a stronger word, hijacked Schmidt's work. And I'm all against this, because this is being done to me, day in and day out. Here, you see, I'm adopting a victim stance. And so, bear in mind the tendency for interpersonal victimhood is the same as victim sensitivity. And if you want to delve deeper into this, I would advise you to look for anything written or authored by Schmidt. Um, and so this is the picture. This is the picture. And it's an unsavory picture. We have transitioned from age, the age of dignity and reputation, the age of upright morality, the age of social cohesion, the age of clear scripts, social, sexual, and otherwise. We have transitioned from all this to a world where everyone competes for being a victim. Why? Because victimhood pays. Victimhood became a cottage industry and has been invaded by mentally ill people, narcissists, psychopaths, sadists, attention deficit grandiose people. These movements, which started off as legitimate social justice movements, have been hijacked and altered beyond recognition. The Me Too movement of today has nothing to do with the Me Too movement of five or six years ago. Nothing. It is rapacious. It is vicious. It is unjust. It is psychopathic. Totally compromised. Same to a large extent with Black Lives Matter. Of course, feminism, the third and fourth waves, <laughs> are unrecognizable variants or the, of the first and second wave. No first and second wave feminist would agree to identify herself with anyone who claims to be a feminist today. Feminism is a power grab, a crass commercial enterprise run by utterly psychopathic and narcissistic figures. This is the world we live in. Victimhood is leveraged. The word is misused. Guilt, tripping, blame shifting. When you identify other people as oppressors or abusers or perpetrators, you give yourself license to behave as one. When you, when you cast other people as criminals, you then feel totally justified in behaving as a criminal or behaving criminally. It's as if the minute you cast yourself as a victim, morality flies out the window and you're entitled to do anything and everything you wish to your heart's content. This is sick. This is dangerous. This must stop. We must speak up. All of us must speak up against this phenomenon. But we are too terrified. We are afraid of losing tenure and our jobs being shunned and cancelled, being prosecuted criminally. It's, it's gone that far. And so, as victims, erstwhile victims, attain positions of power, they bring their victimhood with them into the power structures, compromise the power structures and the institutions, and render them long arms of psychopathic and narcissistic victimhood. It is an untenable situation that is ripping apart the social fabric, generating gender wars, all-out wars, actually, between various interest groups, each one of 
whom, each one of which is claiming to be a victimhood movement. Identity politics is now conflated totally with victimhood. This is bad. This is what gave rise to Nazism. I repeat, this is what gave rise to Nazism. Identity politics conflated with victimhood. If we don't want a repeat of the 1930s, we must stop right here and right now on the collective level and on the individual level. We must fight back against victimhood.